to listen to Jesus alone. Our eyes are to be fixed only on Him. When we look up, we should see no one but Him. Later on, Peter sees much more clearly. And in the book of Acts, in chapter 4, he makes this comment. He says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. And he's talking about Jesus. And even, even the discussion about Elijah as they're going down the mountain points to Christ. The disciples ask him, well, what about Elijah coming? It's the end of the book of Malachi. In where our Old Testament ends. And they're asking about Elijah coming. Well, Jesus knew that the Elijah to come was John the Baptist. In fact, Elijah had already come. And he says, let me tell you what he did. He restores all things, verse 12. And that's, John the Baptist restored all things? Yes, he did. Because he came preparing the way and pointing to Jesus. And it's in Christ that all things are restored. Up to this point in Mark, restored is used twice. Uh, it's used in chapter 3, verse 5, when Jesus restores the man with the withered hand. And it's used in chapter 8, verse 25, when he restored sight to the blind man. And what's being said here is that in Christ, all health and sight, everything spiritually that we need is restored. It is made new in Christ. So everything points to him. Don't forget verses 7 and 8. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And when we look up, we see only Christ with us. That's the message. Now, most of us would prefer to stay on the mountain, right? And bask in the glory and in the presence of God. But we can't live there. In fact, Chris was telling me, and when we were talking about this this week, that uh, you can't live on the mountaintop. No water there, no, no rivers. You can't plant crops on the mountaintop. You can't live there. It might be nice to, to be on the top of Mount Everest for a little while. You don't stay there long. I've, I've climbed several 14,000-foot peaks in Colorado. It's nice to be up there on top. You can't live there. You can't be there in the winter. There's no way to make a living. You, you go down into the valley. That's where life happens. And so Jesus and Peter and James and John come down, and they come down to find the other disciples struggling, unable to help a demon-possessed boy, surrounded by argumentative opponents and surrounded by a disgruntled crowd. They re-entered the world of human failure and demonic discord. That's where we live, folks. That's where we live, not on the top, mountaintop. See, the disciples had been approached by a man seeking deliverance for his son. Uh, they couldn't drive out this unclean spirit. On this occasion, they are found wanting. And their inadequacy brings them public shame because they're surrounded by their enemies. They're surrounded by the people and nobody's happy. If, will these guys never catch on? I mean, what, what, why can't they realize what's happening? Jesus expresses his frustration with them, and, but also his patience. <laughs> when you hear the words, how long will I put up with you? you know, when we say that, it's almost like, I wish you weren't around anymore. I don't want to put up with you any longer. How long is this going to go on? His words, how long, do not convey a wish to be rid of them, but refer to how little time he has left to soften their hardened hearts and acquaint them more fully with the power that can really cast out every evil spirit. Now, the boy's father's also exasperated, but he hasn't lost all hope. He approached Jesus and says, if you can do anything, help us. And Jesus replied, everything's possible for the person who believes. And then this grieving father, this concerned father, makes what I think is one of the greatest statements in all of the Bible. He says, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Does that not resonate 
in your heart? I mean, all of us who fight this same battle that this father was going through need to say that over and over. Yes, Lord, I believe. I can see something, but help me see more clearly. Help my faith to be stronger and and, and greater. That should be the prayer that all of us offer to God every day. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. What a great statement that that is and, and how it includes, I think, all of us. Well, it was then that Jesus cast the evil spirit out of the boy. And I want you to notice the resurrection language used in this account. The people who witnessed this exorcism thought the boy was dead. And I have a feeling he may have been dead. He may have been dead. But Jesus took his hand, lifted him up, and he stood up. This is almost exactly the same language that's used earlier in the story of the raising of Jairus' daughter, who was dead. Took her by the hand, and she stood up. Uh, Here in, in our text, the words can be translated, he raised him up and he was raised. The King James puts it like this, and I like it. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose, is how the King James puts it. This most definitely points to the resurrection of Jesus. This is resurrection language here. I think it also foreshadows the resurrection of the disciples, and I use resurrection in quotation marks. Because when Jesus died, they're just like this boy in the story. They're robbed of speech. They're rigid with fear. They're trembling behind closed doors. They they are spiritually impotent until Jesus was raised from the dead. And then they got their voice back. Then they stood on their feet. Now there's one more little item to discuss in this story. The disciples evidently wanted to learn from their failure. And so in private, they asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast the evil spirit out? The word we betrays their misconception about casting out demons. Now, they've already done this. Remember when Jesus sent them out two by two and they had cast out evil spirits. So they've already done this. But I think now they're relying on their own skill. They're relying on their own power. They they may have wondered if something was wrong with their technique, if they didn't get the words just right or or didn't wave their hands in just the right way. And so the Lord says this, this kind can only come out by prayer. And when he says that, folks, he makes it clear that exorcism has nothing to do with secret lore. It has nothing to do with technique. It has nothing to do with incantations. There's no class you can take that will uh, teach you the ins and the outs of doing this. No exorcism lab in which one can hone their skills. Only God can cast out evil. Only God can do it. The power belongs entirely to him, not to we, not to us. It belongs to him and is released anew every time through a life of prayer. I think we can learn a great deal from these disciples. Aren't we just kind of like them? And we even have, we even have greater revelation than they have, but we, we, at least I do. I seem to be so much like them, beset by failure, too ready to engage in arguments, undisciplined in prayer, more eager to learn some technique than I am to just take time to walk closely with God too enamored with my own skills and abilities? You that way? The prayerful attitude of the concerned father in this story is a necessity for all of us. In fact, I leave you with this, this prayer today. And I hope you'll pray it. Would you bow with me? Lord, I believe... Help my unbelief. And the congregation said, Amen. Amen.